Now there's 10 myths of food plots that I wanted to go over. Food plots are always great, right? Well, one of the first ones, the first uh, point I want to make, the first myth, is that you should even have food plots in the first place. If you're going to spook deer off your plots, if you're going to push deer off your plots, if you're going to hunt on your plots, spook deer, if you're attracting deer to your land with high quality food plots only to spook those deer off after you plant those food plots, then your food plots are doing more harm than good. Just because you have a private land doesn't mean you need to plant food plots if you're going to spook those deer off those food plots. Food plots can be great, but there's just as much risk as there is reward, and that all boils down to if you're gonna spook them off that land or not. Now, I've hardly met a private land that didn't need food plots, but at the same time, if you're gonna spook them, you don't need them. Now, the second myth, and this is really important, a lot of folks have the idea that you're going to plant this great food plot and you're going to provide this year-round source of nutrition on your land. Now if you have a thousand acres or more, large parcels, then you can complete a food plot program and provide nutrition to the deer for the entire year. And maybe if you have 500 acres, but let's face it, a lot of us, myself included, and I have 25 acre parcel, I have a couple 40s that I hunt. Um, I've hunted 165 in the past, but even then, I can't have enough room on those, those uh, lands to provide your round nutrition. And let's face it, most of the time in the north half of the country, deer have five times more food than they need during the summer, during the summer months. So you really don't need your food plot to provide nutrition during the summertime, but boy, those deer really need it pre-winter, post-winter, and during the hunting season as they're building up those fat reserves for the hunting season. At the same time, that's a great time to hunt and that's a great time to mold and shape your deer herd. Your food plots should be peaking in November and that's when you wanna provide nutrition. That's when you wanna provide attraction and that gives you the ability to build that deer herd, hunt a great deer herd, and also do a lot of good for the deer as they're entering the winter and they're recovering from that winter. Now, summer food. This is always a big one. Again, summer food can do more harm than good than fall food. For example, you can establish fawning, fawning grounds, competitive fawning grounds, doe fawning grounds, and those does that are here today are here to stay. So you invite a lot of does and fawns onto your land. They're already there when your fall plots pop up, and those summer plots can actually be building a, an antlerless deer herd on your, your land, creating that problem and that you should have summer plots. Um, there, there, is, there are the exceptions. Lands that are building a herd, lands that are trying to maintain a herd in really low quality habitat areas, they can benefit from some of those summer plots. But a lot of locations, unless you're trying to establish a pattern of use on new lands, building a herd, maintaining a herd, then you really can do more harm than good because you're placing more antlerless deer on your property. I've seen those numbers triple, quadruple because of those food plots, because of great habitat, fawning habitat. And just because you have food plots to plant doesn't need, mean you need to plant them in the summer food, in the summertime. Look up my uh, doe factory videos. If you search for that on uh, YouTube or Google, you'll find those. And there are a lot of risks with planting summer food. Now, hunting on food plots. I've seen recommendations that you should hunt on your food plots 90% of the time or the majority of the time you're gonna hunt on your food plots. And that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, I find, you know, my top 25 bucks, I think two or three have been shot on food plots. It's not to say I don't ever hunt on food plots. In fact, I did last year. I think I sat two out of 15 sits on food plots. But establishing that pattern that you're hunting on those food plots can turn your property nocturnal. And it becomes to a point where I've seen a pattern that your land turns nocturnal over a three or four year period because you're spooking deer off your, your plots, you're hunting and over hunting your plots you're only hunting your plots, and then five, six years down the road, those mature bucks don't even show up on your land because they already recognize your property as a nocturnal property. They might pass through during the rut, but by and large, the older they get, those older mature bucks do not want to have that activity and experience that human activity and that pressure, so they just plain leave. They relocate somewhere else during the daylight hours anyways, and why do they really want to mess around with coming on your land if it's a nocturnal parcel with over 100 food plots? And I've seen that where five, six years down the road, they just simply don't even come on the land. They just stay somewhere else. And yes, that can happen. The does, fawns, young bucks are the great deceivers. They make you think everything's okay, 
but then those mature bucks eventually relocate. They grow out of that hunting pressure that they can tolerate, unlike does, fawns, young bucks. They establish residency somewhere else and they just plain don't visit your land. Now more food plots. A lot, lot look at, well, if one food plot is doing great, let's add two, three, four more. Well, if you have a small parcel, every time you put a food plot in an area, and I've seen this before, people put their best food plots or in, in a food plot in their best locations of mature buck movement. It's a remote area. They think, well, I add a food plot, it'll make it better, easier to hunt those deer. And again, you need to get away from that hunting on a food plot is good. But you add that food plot, every food plot displaces buck bedding, potential buck bedding. The bigger the food plot, the further it pushes off those mature bucks. Does and fawns take over those high quality bedding layers adjacent to the food, young bucks, and then you have room for old bucks. I've seen so many food plotted, plots dotted on a 400 acre parcel that a buck couldn't go 150 yards in any direction before he hit a property border or another food plot. He simply grew out of the property, even though it was 400 acres, because he didn't have anywhere they could call his home and anywhere enough depth of cover to get away from those food plots and grow to an older age. So the neighbors are, they're passing them at one and a half, two and a half, three and a half. The neighbors are shooting them at four and a half, five and a half or six and a half a mile away because he needed to find that reclusive location that lacked a huge number of food plots so he could actually have that depth of cover. You know, simply if you put a five acre food plot in the middle of 40 acres, you only have 155 yards of depth all the way around that five acres poor depth, not enough room, and if you add more food plots and hunting plots in a situation like that, it's even worse. Flip that to a 20 acre parcel, put five acres of food on the, on the south side of a 20 acre rectangle parcel. From the back of that food plot to the north edge of that 20 acres, you have 330 yards of depth. Now you start to have room where you can have does, fawns, young bucks, and then bucks towards the back. You can have a, a stand assemblage, but m often more food plots are not the answer. Now something I see that really I'm passionate about, I've been doing this for many years and looking at food plots analyzing is a lot of folks look at, they have four food plots on their land, they're located appropriately, but then they plant brassicas on one, beans on another, corn on another, clover on another. Very, very bad idea. You want all those blends in each one of those locations at the same time. So you want, if you're gonna put, if you have enough room for corn, uh, beans, clover, brassica, rye, whatever it might be, you put it all on one parcel and you split up those areas. You don't want deer on your land to focus on one food plot in one location and neglect the others. That means those other locations that have adjacent bedding areas, adjacent stand locations, adjacent bedding uh, deer movements and water holes, mock scrapes, they can simply not be used just because the deer are all focusing on one food that's peaking at that time of the year. For example, clover early, brassicas late, beans ultra early or beans ultra late, corn in November. You want those diversities on every food plot so that deer are spread out, your property is efficient and working for you so that does and fawns aren't fighting for the same food plot peaking at the same time. And in that way, your bedding areas, your deer movements, your tree stands are all working for you. If you just put all food and you separate that out each by each food plot, then you only have one or two plots out of four or five working for you at a time. That doesn't separate out your deer herd enough. And when your deer herd's not separate, separated out, what I find is you don't have those mature bucks that slant into each one of those individual movements that relate to each one of those doe movements to a certain food source. Does become territorial, they fight, it's stressful, and there's simply not enough room to hold multiple mature bucks on your area and to slot in those micro movements that are needed when you add the same amount of diversity in every single plot that you have. When choosing which food source to plant, I've seen some scales, and this is a really poor way to look at it, but the myth out there is that you want to plant the most the, the best seeds with the highest level of nutrition. For example, alfalfa has an extremely high level of nutrition, even brassica, uh, soybeans for protein. Um, you need to plant, instead of focusing on nutrition, you need to look at what amount of volume, what's the best volume that you can have during the hunting season so that you can hold that attraction for the entire season, the best combination of plantings. For example, one thing planted on one side, one on the other, 
maybe corn stripped in the middle. You're looking for not necessarily the best nutritional values, but what's going to be and offer an adequate amount of volume that you can actually hold deer on your food plots from the beginning of the season to the end so that you have the ability to mold and shape a deer herd, to mold and shape a great hunt, to advance bucks to the next age class by attracting them, protecting them, holding them, and really to create a high quality QDM style herd where you're not just peaking in May, June, July, August, you're not peaking at the wrong time, and you're actually offering an adequate amount. You're always fighting for that huge amount. And what I like to do is there's a, a food plot pyramid I refer, refer to. I look at like greens are your base, corn a second, and beans are third. If you have enough greens and they're lasting through the hunting season, then consider adding corn. If you have enough greens and corn and that's lasting all hunting season, consider adding beans. A lot of times people are adding beans the, in the first step and then they're offering and creating a substantial holes within their food plots and we'll talk about that coming up. Try to focus on as much adequate volume as you can have so that your food plots last. If you have incredible nutrition during the summertime and the plots are running out in October, didn't do you any good. Probably didn't do the local deer herd any good too because there's enough nutrition in, in the north half of the country during the summertime that you don't need those food plots. The deer don't need those food plots during the summertime. But boy, they sure need them end of September, October, November, especially December. And then if you're offering and creating quality plots, there should be some green rye or, or wheat available before spring green up when nothing else in the woods is green. Focus on volume and that's the quickest ticket to a great deer herd and a great hunt. Now, I started planting a lot of plots. I first started planting in the thumb area of Michigan and I had good ag soil back in 95, 96, 97. But then I jumped up into the UP of Michigan with a lot of sand, sandy loam, 65 tons of lime, bag lime per acre, you know, uh, throughout eight acres, throughout six years that I had to um, put down into the ground. Lots of fertilization, frequent rotations of buckwheat and rye. But contrary to some advice I received, local conservation force, you never plant food plants on this land, I took that as a challenge. And I found that you don't pick the best soil for your food plots, you pick the best location. No different than you don't pick the best tree on your land to put a tree stand on, you pick the best tree in the best location for the deer movement that you're after and to provide you with a great hunt. So we really need to think about that. It's not the best soil. Is this an adequate amount of soil? Even going back to the nutritional seeds, you're looking for a, the right volume, not necessarily the best seed variety that has the best nutritional values. You're looking for the best location might not be the, the necessarily the best soil on your land. The old advice, the old style, old fashioned advice that didn't work was grab a soil map, pick your food plot locations. That couldn't be further from the truth. You need to consider your access. You need to consider where the deer are moving. You need to consider how that food plot sets up the lay of the land, complements the lay of the land, can be hidden from your approach, from other people, from your neighbor's land and can offer actually a true movement and define a movement on your property on a daily basis that might not be the best soil on your land. Now, of course, you can't plant in rocks and water, and you may have to, to stump out some areas, you may not have an ability to do that. But what it all boils down to, pick the best location that might not necessarily be the best soil. When you're planting, there's all kinds of expensive drills, drags, disc, tractors. There's so much equipment that you can buy. Now I love that equipment. It's, it's great when you have that equipment. Um, when you have it to plant, it can save you a lot of time, but it doesn't save you a lot of money. You can have beautiful plots, and I invite you to follow us this year and watch what we're doing with minimal equipment. We might use a light disc, but an ATV, an ATV sprayer, a light disc, maybe a call to packer, maybe a handheld spreader, but watch what we can accomplish with our plots and what can be grown. I've been planting no-till plots for many years with just simply an ATV and a hand spreader and an ATV sprayer, and that's it. There's so much that you can do. There's incredible plots that you can build by just, you know, a hand spreader, even using a backpack sprayer. You can have beautiful plots. It just takes more walking and working. But you don't need a lot of expensive equipment to have great plots. Don't let the thought of, boy, I need to spend thousands of dollars. And uh, now you might want to hide this segment from your spouse if you're trying to talk them into a, a real nice tractor right now or a setup. And, and again, I love those. I, I put over 500 hours on a nice Kubota I had in the past. 
Um, I, I don't mind using good equipment, but you can get it done. We traveled for 12 years from uh, the UP of Michigan, seven, 10 years, um, seven hours down to the Southwest Wisconsin here. And we had beautiful six acres, a beautiful six acres of plots. And you can get it done with light equipment. You don't need a lot of money. Now, finally, don't fall victim, please, to the magic bean. There's the magic bean out there. You plant this soybean, you're gonna have all the deer in the woods in your area. Folks, the number one food plot failure that I see around the country on client properties, and I've analyzed over 800 food plot programs in 26 states for my profession, for my career, what I do, is a soybean planting. And I'm not saying that you never plant soybeans. But again, it goes back to that green base. You have to fill that green base that can cover you the entire season. Then you have corn, then you have beans. Beans fail for many reasons. I've seen them rot in the spring because it wasn't a cold winter, cold December, and the deer didn't hit them. The year before, there was 50 deer on four acres of beans all winter long and in December on the same property. I've seen many, many bean plantings. I can't tell you how many I've seen, at least dozens, maybe hundreds, but I've seen bean plantings fail because they didn't even make it till October. And again, in locations, a lot of times where people are planting beans, if it's an ag area, even a deep wooded area, if it's in a northern area, a lot of times those deer have a lot more nutrition that they can tap into in the area and you don't need to plant those beans for the summertime. So a lot of times they're not needing the nutrition and if the beans are down to the dirt by October, then it's a huge failure because then you can attract, build, hold, hunt a deer herd. And after all, why do you have your property? If you have private land, and you have the room for food plots, then I bet you really want to hunt a good deer herd and that's what you're spending a lot of time and effort into. Unless you just like taking care of the deer. But even then, if those beans are down to the dirt by October, then it wasn't a great planting. Now I've seen beans fenced. Um, I've seen eight foot fences around beans and they open them up. And there's a lot of good ideas that you can do to get beans in. But even then, in big ag areas, you see a lot of value with soybean foraging through the early September, maybe even in the end of September. And then there's a gap in there and they're turning more to corn and greens and then they're hitting the beans late if they're still standing and that's a big if in a lot of areas so if you get them to december and you have all your bases covered in all your plots with the greens and the corn and you have that combination that can be the best of all worlds i go to a lot of clients where i'm recommending greens corn and beans because they have those acreage sizes and those are a lot of fun but when it comes down to small properties small parcels two, three acres of food plot on a land. Like I, I have 40 acres, a couple of those, a 25 acre parcel. So I'm planting acre and a half on one parcel, two and a half, three acres on, on another, and uh, and on both of the others, the, the other 40s. I couldn't afford to plant beans, not dollar wise, but because they'd be down to the dirt and I just wouldn't be able to hold those deer um, in through the hunting season. So it would do no good. And they have beans everywhere and alfalfa around here. so. There is a case for the bean, but beans aren't always the first uh, step. They should be the last step in your, in your uh, solution most of the time. Not to say that beans um, aren't the only thing that you plant on a certain parcel, but it's very rare, and I want you to consider that. There's a lot of myths with food plotting. Bottom line, if you can get that diversity established on your property, if those food plots are hidden, if you're not over hunting them, if they're in the right location, not necessarily the best soil. If you can get around them while hunting and they set up a, a definitive, definitive line of movement on your land, then food plots are an awesome power that I think almost every private landowner should be considering and should put on their land if they follow and kind of debunk these myths and make sure that you're getting a lot more reward out of your food plots than risk during this summer and into the hunting season. Food plots can build a great herd and a great hunt, maintain that throughout the years, or they can give you some negative returns. And I hope these 10 myths make sense. And I look forward to hearing about it. Leave some comments below. Make sure you subscribe to my channel for other in-depth tips for food plotting and everything else whitetail.